Koans are paradoxical riddles, folk tales, or mind puzzles. It's usually some kind of question like, what is the sound of one hand clapping? Another koan is the question, what is your face before your parents were born? Koans define logic and disrupt ordinary rationality. For practitioners of Zen Buddhism, <clears throat> this disruption is only to be expected. Koans clear space for truth. A koan can also be straight for a straightforward statement like the one a friend gave me years ago. It was her favorite koan. It goes, walk when you walk, sit when you sit, but this above all, do not waddle. <laughs> I don't know if I could spend a year meditating on that one, but there it is. Meditating on an enigmatic phrase is supposed to help the aspirant reorder the thought processes and examine the way that the contemplative life is lived. The thought of sitting in a monastery garden day after day, meditating on a confusing question given by one designated as a master for his or her wisdom, sounds like something that might be appealing to me for a couple of days at most. To spend months meditating on the same phrase would be unthinkable for most of us. It requires extensive training and resources, and maybe it's easy to understand the spiritual regimen better if one lives in an Asian culture. Anyway, the aspiring Zen monk or uh, wise person is often, well, the aspiring Zen monk is often boxed on the ears for not meditating seriously enough on the koans to satisfy the master. But we need not look to a Zen master to find koans. There are enigmatic phrases and questions that surround us if we are looking for them. They are little things that seem unreasonable or require greater attention, greater meditation, questions, or even situations that call us to seek beyond reason. One of them uh, happened to someone I knew, a friend named Scott. We met at the Unitarian Universalist Church I attended before I went to seminary. Scott was a chemical engineer at a chemical plant in North Georgia. He was the one responsible for making sure that the plant complied with federal environmental and safety regulations. This meant that Scott had to read many volumes of government publications regarding all kinds of materials and processes. For many people, this sounds like a terrible profession because there's little contact with people and the federal regulations are painstakingly particular. It's the kind of work that requires a mind for details and clear analytical thinking and patience, I would think. For Scott, though, these reg regulations were interesting. He was a scientist and valued clear thinking. He was also a material rationalist in his theology. There was nothing that couldn't be proven by science. There was nothing that went beyond science in his mind. Scott did not believe in God because he find, found the evidence was insufficient to have faith. One day, Scott was in the chemical plant at his desk, browsing through a federal regulatory manual. It was numbered by chapter. That is, the first section of the manual was numbered A1, A2, A3, and so on. The next section would be numbered B1, B2, B3, and so on. You get the idea. In between the chapters, let's imagine between pages A27 and B1 was a white divider page. Upon the center of the unnumbered page, in large, bold letterings were the words. This page intentionally left blank. Now you see, some of you are beginning to understand where the problem was. 
The surprise Scott. I don't know why it surprised him. It certainly had happened to him before. In fact, it surprised him so much that he could not let go of the enigma. In front of him, he read letters on a page that told him that the page was blank. <laughs> but was it blank if it had wording on the page? And was it reasonable that the lettering told him that it was a blank page? This set Scott into a quandary. Every time I saw him over the course of the next few months, he had to talk about that page. <laughs> it really took him. In the midst of this federal regulatory manual, a testament to human reason was a statement that befuddled the clearest thought. He was meditating, not really meditating, he was contemplating it. Every time that he mentioned the blank page over the time, I began to see in my mind's eye little smiling Buddhas circling around his head. He had found a koan without knowing much about Zen. Chance exposed him to the subject that would force him to reconsider the universe and his vision of it all. The announcement that he stared at a blank page was a koan. It took him a while to see it as such. For this was the kind of irrational conundrum that a Zen master might have assigned Scott to help him move beyond the need for a purely rational and materialistic vision of human existence. Koans need to be recognized through questions about the purpose they serve. We may see something that our monkey mind, as Zen masters call it, initially ignores. It might be brought out by a kind of critical question about the statement that moves us to look at the irrational. For example, on the doors leading to the main terminal at a California airport I went through about 20 years ago was a sign in large letters that reads, no dogs allowed. In the smaller print below that, those words were the words, except for seeing eye dogs. That's what they called them back then. Who was supposed to read that small print? <laughs> it's, it was a co-op. I believe because it, a, it asks us to look at all the possibilities and perhaps see the unreason in human nature. Even here it is possible to find statements that are somewhat enigmatic. I know I've, I've written about this before. Uh, my colleague Carl Scovel calls the Christian koan, by living we die, by dying we live. You need to know a little bit about Carl. Carl grew up in a Buddhist environment, even though his parents were Presbyterian missionaries. They were medical missionaries to China and spent some part of his childhood in a uh, prisoner of war camp run by the Japanese. So he knew Buddhism quite well and he knew Christianity quite well. And maybe combining the two was part of his journey as a Unitarian Universalist. But that's his koan, the one he sees. Koans are like that. They intentionally turn reality upside down to move the one meditating to another place. It's an interesting exercise to find them when they occur in a sign at the airport or in something like a regulatory manual. It is a stuff of intellect to see the irrational where the irrational is assumed. Finding koans might seem like a pleasant game that exercises the imagination to see the irrational in the human world. And that way, Koans might seem a little like a parlor game or totally irrelevant to our experience. <clears throat> but there are other kinds of koans. They are the kinds that are as enigmatic and unanswerable as the one the Zen Buddhist monks give their students, but lead us to search after the answers and require some suspension of reason. Reason does not provide answers to these koans and the urgency of the response to them is dictated by a crisis. They are the questions that people ask when something terrible has happened, when nothing in the world seems to be rational. We turn to each other to hear for one moment a response to that which is unknown. 
most people, most of the time, are caught up in the delusion that they control their lives. We seek this or that goal and calculate how to maximize pleasure and to minimize pain. Zen teachers suggest, however, that living a calculated life can actually impede the experience of pleasure and bring its own kind of pain. Koans, by absorbing one's attention and defying reason, can release one from the emotional clutter of constant calculation, cause and effect, bring one to live in the moment as it opens to eternity where one can find bliss in the most simple act, such as breathing. This experience is what the Buddhists call enlightenment. This experience of koans is intended to liberate one from calculation and sometimes the illusion of reason. Most of us assume in our daily lives that tomorrow will be like yesterday. We will get up in the morning and do the things that we do every day without much incident. We will enjoy the day, talk to our friends and family, much as we did in the past. Life goes on in those same patterns as before. We expect this to be the way things will always be. Then something happens and we wind up being in the hospital or somewhere wondering what is going on. When I was training in crisis counseling for my student chaplaincy, I was told that the thing that many people ask in an emergency room or the sick bed is a simple question, why me? Why has this bad thing happened? How can God or the universe permit this occur when I've always tried to be a good person? It's an essentially religious question that strikes at the center of our universe and at the center of our natures. We assume that we will never be the one asking the question unless this happens to us. For many of us, this might sound like the kind of question that people who are religious conservatives, who view God as a protector, always looking out for them, might ask. But it is larger than that. It is asked in many ways. It might be the person who has cancer sitting up in bed in hospice, asking how this happened when that person never smoked or lived with a smoker. This enigmatic question may have a practical answer, like the proximity of her home to a coal-burning power plant or something like that. But there is always a seed of the question, why me, in this? There is a need to know why the universe has permitted bad things to happen. Why is the virtuous life left to something led to something like this. And we will all probably be confronted by enigmatic questions like these, eventually in one way or another. This might be because our view of our relationship with the universe is flawed. We don't go on forever, as before. The Earth keeps spinning on its axis at a fairly regular rate. Gravity still happens. But we, in our lives, have different experiences. We want to believe in consistency. We want, believe, want to believe that we will not suffer. In American culture, an effort exists to hide the painful and complex parts of life. I think that our culture is constructing walls to deny the hardness of existence. Edith Wharton was an American author, and she wrote about someone escaping this reality in her novel, Twilight Sleep. Pauline, the main character, is a very rich woman who, has turns, who turns to a different faith healer every week to heal her mind, body, and spirit of ailments she has not yet discovered. Edith Wharton writes, Nothing frightened and disorganized Pauline as much as direct contact with physical or moral suffering, especially physical, her whole life, if one chooses to look at it from a cer certain angle, had been a long, un uninterrupted struggle against the encroachment of every form of pain. The first step always was to conjure it, bribe it away, by every possible expenditure, except of oneself. 
checks, surgeons, nurses, private rooms and hospitals, x-rays, radium, what, whatever was most costly and up-to-date in the dreadful art of healing. That was her first and strongest line of protection. Behind it came such lesser works as rest cures, change of air, a seaside holiday, a whole new set of teeth, pink silk bedspreads, lace cushions, stacks of picture papers, and hothouse grapes and long-stemmed roses. All her life had been used to buy off, buying off suffering with money or denying its existence with words, and her moral muscles had become so atrophied that only some great shock could restore their natural strength. This seems reminiscent of the experience of Gautama Siddhartha, the Buddha. He was born a prince, and his parents were told that he would either become a great king or a wise religious man. Now, given that his dad was already a king, you can imagine which one they wanted. Hoping that Gautama would become a great king, his parents took great efforts to make sure that their little princeling would never witness suffering. By accident, Gautama witnessed suffering, and that experience caused him to leave the palace, forsaking his wealth and power, to become a wandering sage, seeking out and finding enlightenment. The enigmatic question, why me, is something we cannot answer absolutely. The question requires a response that only the questioner can believe in. He or she looks onward to assess the world. Koans are given as an as enigma because life is full of enigma. It is our delusion to believe that we can control all the events of our lives, that reason alone dictates the course of human existence. Many of us expend much energy worrying about the future. I myself have been very guilty of this. Without, we, this journey can be fruitless at times. I, when I was in just attending the Unitarian Universalist Church, I wanted to get into seminary. So I worried about getting into seminary. I got into seminary, then I worried about getting the right internship, the right, uh, right training. Then, once most of that was accomplished, I worried about going before the Ministerial Fellowship Committee. And what the very day that I received fellowship from the Unitarian Universalist Association, I moved directly, immediately into worrying about finding a ministry position. I didn't even take a moment to just bask in the glow of that moment. I immediately looked so far to the future, I could not be where I was right then. Worry is entirely fruitless, unless it motivates one to plan for the future, or to, to try to plan for the future. Most of us went to school hoping to become educated, and perhaps to prepare for our professional lives. Yet we might, though we might plan for the future, None of us knows what shape it will take. Like a Zen Buddhist, Jesus of Nazareth said, who can, by worrying, can add a single hour to his life? Simply put, the act of calculating the future and worrying about its outcome is not necessarily going to enrich one's life. Making plans can obscure one from being here and now. It's too easy to obsess about the future planning for the day that will come and when it arrives to move on to the next plan. It's not fitting for us to come up with an answer to the koans that are given to us and say that one is correct. We accept that everyone must confront the universe or the divine on terms set by the experience of one's own life. As Yun Min, a medieval Zen master wrote, the master can only bear testimony. If you have gained something from within, he can't hide it from you. If you haven't gained anything, 
he can't find it for you. This is an important reason that I am a Unitarian Universalist. I know that the response to one hand clapping, do not waddle, or why me, should not be given in our tradition, but must be developed from one's own heart. There is a need to accept that the universe is not all sameness, not all given to narrow interpretation and that everybody has to think the same things. In closing, may we find the responses to the koans or dilemmas. May they show us a way that a being that is clearer and more deliberate and more present in the here and now. May we not waddle. May our reason be challenged and our faith deepened so that we might understand better the universe and our place within it. So may it be with all. Amen.